My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I must confess the last slide was finished uh, 20 minutes ago, so don't expect any polished <laughs> talk about this. But um, I hope there's something interesting for everybody. So this agenda, uh, I think you can read it yourself. <laughs> I don't need to read for you. So we go over kudos, SMSQ, and the rest. So the design might be a bit strange. Why is it this way? Uh, this is a screen of a QL. So we have three windows. Um, we have the command line window, channel zero at the bottom, um, the output window, channel one, uh, right side, and channel two, the basic listing window, basically, um, on the left side. I decided to um, <laughs> do the presentation in this format and um, as a joke, but um, yeah, it's not really suitable for this kind of thing, but I stuck with it. Okay, just a few words about myself. My name is Martha Kilgus. I'm a software engineer at the company Festo, which does automation equipment. I started really early at age seven with a ZX81, got a single QL at age 10 or so, um, and finally got a PC uh, later because, I mean, four colors are enough for a while, but um, at some stage you want a bit more. But I had such a guilty conscience about it that uh, I actually wrote a 68,000 emulator called QPC for it. So uh, to have uh, still have my QL environment on the PC. And that was, I think it was released 95 or 96 and I'm still developing it today. So it's been going on for a while. I also have hobbies and the technical ones are, I, I like reverse engineering old software and stuff. And I have got in the habit of doing FPGA and others, uh, Perhaps a bit uh, later or a bit more about it. So let's start with the main topic, single QL operating systems. That's a bit of the history behind it. I was too young to actually experience uh, or, or know much of it because uh, I mean, the internet didn't really exist much back then. But um, here's a short rundown. Originally, the company GST was tasked to write the operating system for the QL which was uh, to be named 68K OS. And they did another operating system as a backup in, uh, uh, within Sinclair that is called Domestos. Domestos was a Unix that works. <laughs> Apparently the Unix back then were pretty um, slow and buggy and whatever. So they wanted to do something better. Um, ultimately, uh, they decided in Domestos and 68K OS was also released, but it never gained any traction. Um, there are boards some, sometimes on eBay, but they are quite rare and quite expensive. Um, the author of Kudos is Tony Tebby, who uh, wrote that he could only do the technology, uh, technological risks he did because he knew he was only the backup. Uh, if all the pressure uh, were, had been on him, I think he would have uh, done stuff differently and not as well as it turns out, because in the end, the Sinclair QL was deeply flawed and wasn't a commercial success because of it, but it still lives to, to today because the rating system and the concepts were pretty great for the time and maybe still in some cases. Um, yeah, the first QLs were actually de 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 delivered with another EEPROM hanging out the back and a pre-production firmware, even though apparently the production firmware was already available because Sinclair wanted to blame the software for the uh, delays they had. Um, basically, um, they said they uh, could deliver QLs 28 days after uh, presenting uh, the computer and nothing worked at that stage. And they collected money pre-orders and that's uh, illegal. So that was apparently some way to shift the blame. 
Um, as I said, the, the uh, author of the kernel is Tony Tebby, who uh, quit Sinclair actually after the presentation because uh, he said it's impossible to ship this thing within a month. Uh, he later formed a company called Qjump and uh, continued to write software for the QL, very important software, and he's now retired. Another part of Qdus is a super basic variant, which was written by Jane Jones. <laughs> she now writes apparently romantic novels. I haven't checked it. Um, Qdus was shipped in two ROM chips in the end, one 32K and one 16K internally, which left another 16K for extensions. The truly innovative features were it's, I think it's uh, preemptive multitasking. And uh, apparently it was designed to run up to 100 jobs at the same time. And that is on a seven and a half megahertz, six to eight thousand eight. So that's not too bad. It had a very extensible IO subsystem, which I think was the main uh, reason uh, it could be extended and, and, and further developed as it is. And it's probably um, one of the main reasons it, it still has some users or some followers. Uh, the super basic has its name for a good reason. It's really a pretty super basic. Um, it has procedures, functions, uh, go to was frowned upon. So um, you could write reasonably well code in it especially if you consider the uh, alternatives at the time. The successors of Qdus are called Minerva and SMS Cree. So a short rundown, I will not read everything here, but Qdus are generally, um, the version are generally called by uh, two letters, like FB, PM, AH. Um, Apparently, those were either uh, initials of Sinclair employees or taxi drivers. Uh, I'm not sure. Both versions exist. Minerva was called JSL1. And SMS QE was HPA and was the one that starts with version 2. So we have uh, one continuous version uh, line between the three OSs, which is the problem for Minerva because it's hit 198. Uh, no, yes, and 199 is the last one, and after that it would shift to 200, and that would probably be a big compatibility hassle for software that tests for SMS QE by the version number. Um, a few uh, words about Minerva. It was much improved Kudos, much, much better than the original. It was mainly written, I think, by Lawrence Reeves, and he's a true wizard when it comes to 68,000 uh, code. It's uh, quite amazing what he put into 48K. It's open source, you can download it. Um, 240 source files, uh, about some 36,000 lines of code. Um, it was much faster than the original, much, much more refined. It's the only operating system, the QL had two different screens which you could uh, switch between. Uh, a few games used it to, f to do frame switching, but generally it wasn't used at all. And it's the only operating system that actually supported this uh, kind of thing. Um, because at the start of the second screen, Qdos lay its system variables, so it couldn't work with the second screen enabled. Um, Minerva had the op uh, option to move the system variables, which is a big compatibil compatibility problem, but um, for some software it worked well. It had multi-basic, so it could run several basics at the same time, other than Qdos, which only had one main basic and no others. Um, one of the main, main features I like is a software reset. A soft reset per, through keyboard, it's uh, very handy. And I would, if you ever would uh, work or try a real QL, it's a recommended operating system, if you ask me. That if you're not using, ah, oh, wait, that's something else first. Um, a QL as is, is pretty much unusable. The basic comments you really need are still lacking 
they're not part of the ROM. So there are a few ex um, essential add-ons that you really need. And one very essential add-on is the Toolkit 2. It's also written by Tony Tebby on uh, with QChamp. And it adds many, many comments that are really necessary to have a, a good experience. Um, especially the screen editor where we can actually edit the uh, basic uh, more easily is very, very important. Um, there's also the so-called extended or pointer environment, which is um, a complete set of tools that exchange the whole screen driver of the operating system and replaces it one with um, non-destructible windows. So you just always had multitasking. It, it always had a concept of a window which you could print to or draw to or whatever. Um, but they always were destructible. So if you switch tasks, you had to uh, hit some key to refresh the window or whatever. And the pointer environment um, replaced that um, with a driver that actually had a back, back buffer for every window, which it could use to uh, reconstruct the window. So that's the concept that was again adopted um, 20 years later by Mac OS or Windows. Um, so also somewhat ahead of its time, but also of course a bit risky um, because you don't, didn't have that much memory back then. There's also the WMAN, the window manager, which adds standard windowing uh, to the system. That is data structures, APIs, uh, drawing functions, the whole uh, pointer, mouse pointer reading, and so is, is implemented there. And there's a hotkey system, which is um, really cool for power users to um, put uh, some actions on uh, some hotkeys. So you type Alt. X or whatever, and something happens on your system. Um, this is what a basic QL system could look like with the point environment. Um, this is now on an emulator, so not every system uh, QL had 22 megabyte of RAM, as shown in the upper left corner. The top is uh, called QPAC2. It's a, so, some button frame. You had your buttons there, which you could start programs with, or which programs uh, minimize to. So it's a bit like the taskbar in today's systems. I put the QShell, what, which was a pretty great file manager back in the day, which actually tra drag and drop and everything. And just to show uh, one, one uh, window video, uh, L job for deleting or killing jobs. Okay, now we come to SMS query, which really is the pinnacle of uh, QL operating systems. It was also developed by Tony Tebby, of course. And since to, uh, 1996, about also by me. So Tony Tebby retired some years after, so I'm the longest running maintainer of the <laughs> operating system. Um, it's the main and sometimes sometimes only operating system for different QL platforms, like QPC, which is my own emulator. QXL is, uh, uh, for example, a uh, 86,040 uh, plug-in card for PCs. Back in the day, it's uh, ESA based. Q40 is a uh, 8640 uh, board. Q86 is a fairly recent um, FPGA-based solution. And back in the day, Atari was actually the most advanced, uh, Atari ST, most advanced uh, platform for QLE. So you uh, had to, um, um, there were graphics cards for the Atari ST, which you could put into, so to get the QL compatible uh, graphics modes. SMS basically consists of everything that happened before. So we had uh, the SMS2 kernel, with SMS2 was small micro system or something, um, which was an operating system aimed at Atari, which he, uh, which wasn't QL compatible back then, but which was developed into SMSQ, which was again QL compatible. Then he uh, added a basic, the whole uh, 2K2 extended environment and some new uh, device drivers for um, floppy and uh, hard drives and so on. <clears throat> 
and that uh, compromised SMS GUI back in the day. S Basic is a faster, basically a faster super basic. It's uh, internally a compiler architecture, so it uh, executes a lot faster than the old interpreted uh, uh, super basic. It's the only uh, QL compatible uh, operating system that actually um, supports high color displays. The original QL only had um, a high, high resolution four color display and a lower resolution eight color display. And um, SMS QE also supports uh, 256 and 56,000 colors. The 256 uh, color mode was actually implemented by me back then. Um, it's been open source since 2002, and it was relicensed uh, to BSD in 2013. Um, some over 200,000 lines of code and some 2,000 source files, which is still just 200 to maybe 400 um, kilobyte of code, which um, is quite a lot for a QL system, but um, not so much uh, these days. It's mainly uh, developed these days with uh, by Wolfgang Linnertz, who is also the maintainer. He um, curates the official distribution of it, and basically me, with help of some others that say, hey, I can here, here's a new basic command or so. But the main development is, is done by us too. Um, I actually use SMS GUI to develop SMS GUI as a, as the, it's, it's, I don't do cross compiling or anything uh, usually. It's, it's a good enough desktop, desktop environment to actually be usable. And the whole SMS GUI development is still like 20 years ago. So we do email and uh, uh, send zip files uh, here and there. So that's a bit lacking at the moment. But I think eventually we'll get to real source code management. OK, that's how this looks like as an example today. Um, that's just some example uh, uh, source code files from SMS QE. Uh, a disassembler that a friend of mine has written some 20 years ago, or not more, and QMake, which is a make utility for assembler, and which are used to actually make SMS QE. The whole thing is seen on a 16-bit display with the new window manager, which I also wrote, uh, that actually makes use of the colors. I uh, thank you for the strategies. Look, that was what I go uh, was going for. I did mostly just for fun, but it, it's if you compare it to the original, I think yeah, it was a pretty pretty uh, big improvement. Um, if you look closely, you can even see that the cursor, which is in the window below, has alpha blending, just for fun. And um, I even introduced something uh, called a system palette. So uh, it, it's, no, um, it's no coincidence that all uh, windows uh, match in color. Um, it's an old concept. I mean, even uh, Windows uh, 3 or whatever had the system that, that you could define a button looks like this and uh, something looks like that. So I introduced that back then when I made the high color version. And yes, I, I'm actually pretty proud of it. <laughs> OK. So get into the deep. Um, here's an example memory map for the technically inclined. You've got um, QDOS ROM uh, at the bottom, uh, optional ROM extension uh, further up the screen. Starts at uh, 20,000 hex. Then you have the system variable ups and 28,000 hex and the second screen. So that's usually not, not usable. There's a common heap for memory allocations. Um, free area, super basic. Transient program and resident procedure area. I should have started from the top, actually. The resident procedure area is the one that um, is filled when you load uh, additionally uh, additional uh, basic extensions, for example, on, on boot. And on QDOS, that one was locked as soon as you started the first job. Job, I should say, is something like a process these days. So uh, every job is 
multitask with the other jobs in the system. So that was finished. As soon as the first job was in the scene, you couldn't load any more stuff in the resident procedure area because then the transient program area uh, started to get filled. And that crew, both crew downwards and the common heap crew upwards. And in the middle is a super basic area. Now, you don't have much memory, and memory fragmentation is even today a huge problem if you're not on 64 bit uh, machines at least. So, um, they did one clever trick basically. Super basic could move at any time. Um, it's always pointed to A6, the base of it is always pointed to A6. And you all had to do all your uh, addressing relative to A6 if you want to access anything there. Um, if you really had to use absolute um, pointers, you had to switch to supervisor mode. Otherwise, at any rate rescheduling, it could move. If the common heap grew, it would move upwards and so on, or transient program area uh, moved downwards. So that was a pretty interesting concept to, to make best use of the memory there. SMS QE doesn't have this limitation, but then it uh, also has uh, much more uh, memory to work with. The, the uh, smaller system that can run SMS QE has two megabyte of RAM, with, which is a CPU accelerator card called Gold Card, and later the uh, four megabyte Super Gold Card too. The reason uh, SMS QE doesn't run on an original QL is, for one, not enough memory. And uh, other reason is um, that it needs to replace uh, the whole operating system at uh, address zero. And it can't do that uh, as there's from there. The, uh, this gold card and super gold card can, um, can map RAM at that address. And uh, so as MSQ we can boot up there. That's a rough cut of the architecture I drew uh, this uh, or last last evening. Um, you have some kernel, you have a, a scheduler which runs the jobs and the super basic uh, in parallel. Super basic is a special job. Um, I read I read up on some history uh, only uh, this week for in preparation from Tony Tebby how it. Uh, it's um, how it was back in the day um, at Sinclair. It's a pretty horrible account of what's going on. That was one of the most mismanaged <laughs> uh, projects probably in the uh, history of uh, computer. But um, long story short, one of his biggest requests, uh, regrets was that uh, Super Basic was a special job. Um, but it was for time reasons mostly. So we basically can load extensions that are put on top so you can have new comments, um, which was a really great feature back then. And the other big part is the IO system, which is um, separated into filing system drivers and IO device drivers. I have some more about that on the later slide. Uh, I just the scheduler runs up uh, at least 50 times per second and often more if there's IO to be made the scheduler is run again on a very fast system like the QPC emulator it can run up to 60,000 times per second okay IO drivers IO drivers uh, pass their own names so this example here is a con is a console driver it opens a window 512 by 200 pixels at the uh, upper left origin and 128 uh, bytes keyboard buffer, for example. Several uh, drivers were um, were already integrated in the computers, like NET, which is a very simple peer-to-peer uh, -peer network, but um, actually for the price or back at the day, pretty cool. So you will pipe for inter-process communication. Con uh, screen is basically the same as con, but you couldn't uh, get any keyboard input to it, but it was a window on screen. SMS QE added uh, a few more default um, drivers like history, which is 
actually not a, a byte based in this, in this case it's a string based you could put a string in there and could uh, pull it out again so it, uh, I at some point a few years ago I, I um, implemented um, comment line history in basics so you could uh, key up key down and get the old uh, comments back so like standard in every other system these days and I actually implemented use this history device, so it didn't have to do the data handling. Um, and QSound, that device is actually new. That only happened this year. That was also written by me, which is a sound driver for the old A uh, AI, AY um, um, sound chips, music chips. Um, every I.O. call had a timeout. You could say minus one, which is blocking call. You could say zero, which is non-blocking, and it always returns immediately. Or you could uh, set a time and say, hey, wait this many uh, 20 millisecond uh, uh, steps, and uh, if not, return to me, if nothing happens. The timer is, is, is handled on the uh, operating system side, and the driver just had to return. Uh, oh, I'm not finished yet. Uh, to be called again at a later stage. File systems. Uh, file systems drivers always had uh, three characters. MDVs, the microdrives. This is, I don't know, uh, that's a keychain, um, but that is a microdrive. One of the unique features of the QL, and that's the biggest selling point at that. Um, FLP is floppy and Win stands for Winchester and is still today the uh, or the hard drives, hard disks. File names are formed uh, using underscores. So Win one test is on hard drive one file test or directory uh, file txt, and that's one one of the major deficiencies of the query which we could never get rid on, uh, of is that extension and directory separators are actually the same which makes uh, things very interesting if you want to interface uh, pc based uh, disks uh, interesting meaning difficult and uh, their directories uh, were just an afterthought they were not part of the original design and was difficult to um, to integrate after the fact. And the way it's done is we still live with the decision today, which is, for example, that a file name can only have 36 characters. And that, unfortunately, is including the directory. So not 36 characters per level, but total. Various. Um, Efforts were made to circumvent this, but it's a compatibility nightmare, and it's still the uh, one of the biggest uh, drawbacks of the QL operating systems. Um, somewhat innovative at the time was that every um, file had metadata besides the date also. It also had the file type, and if the file type needed some special data, it also, um, it also was part of that. And of course, that too is a problem these days because these, uh, this data gets lost if you have it on any non-QL um, disk. Uh, and uh, they are actually retained in, in zip files. There's a special extra field where you can put stuff in, but the zips must be uh, unpacked with intruders to restore them. And that's one of the biggest um, problems uh, new user experience, mostly, I think. Um, some emulators, including my own, have now started to um, uh, prepend the header uh, in band, so put it at the start of the file. And towards the operating system, uh, pretend it's not there. It's, um, yes, a bit difficult and slower and everything, but it's, it's no. Nah, the best trade-off in my eyes. Um, some uh, basic uh, OS RP definitions. The kernel use, uses the traps uh, zero through three. Uh, zero is just enter supervisor mode and do whatever you want. Uh, number one was uh, the kernel interface to allocate memory. Uh, 
create new jobs, delete jobs, uh, uh, link in a new driver or polls routine or scheduler routine, uh, everything that's, that's basically kernel uh, based. Uh, number two is uh, file, open, close, delete. And number three is the whole of file IO. And the good thing there is that the whole file IO is delegated to the driver. So it's the only draft that can actually be um, replaced by more advanced um, code because it's not in ROM. All the others are, are hard code in ROM. You can't do much there, but uh, number three can be extended uh, without limits. Um, basic, on the other hand, uses vector routines. And as an exception, trap number four, which makes every address register for the next trap call relative to A6, because as I remember, A6 uh, can move at any time. So you could never have absolute addresses in basic. There's no standard calling convention. I mean, uh, one thing I haven't written here is uh, D, D0 is uh, the, the key for the traps. And um, D3, I've written in the earlier slide, is um, the timeout. But apart from that, there's no real calling convention. It's A, A1 here and A2 there. Uh, it's a bit, but it, it's not a calling convention in the sense uh, uh, um, uh, high level language like C uh, has a calling convention. The first parameter goes there, the second there, um, which makes um, interfacing with the operating system a bit uh, difficult for high level languages. Basically, you had to write code by hand for every call you want to wrap. Um, oh, I'll repeat my there, here, strap number four. System variables are already mentioned. Um, these are most of the variables that are needed to run the system. Um, and back in the day, of course, people use them directly. So it's basically impossible to move them or do anything much about them, except maybe extending them to some degree. Um, with the hotkey system I mentioned earlier, there also came a new thing, uh, thing called the thing system, which is um, I don't not well understood by most people, and even myself, I had sometimes difficulty to wrap my head around. But it's basically a, a system to to find stuff again. So it can have a name, and by the name you uh, can get it again. And you have some standard API uh, calling conventions there, because um, back in the day you could only basically um, extend basic. You could, uh, a floppy driver, for example, could um, could um, link new basic procedures in to do something with the floppy controller. But afterwards, you could only call them from basic. So there was no way to call them from any other language. And the sync system does provide a, a standard calling up uh, API gateway plus a wrapper that does the basic procedures with all additional code, basically. So that was a pretty clever way, but uh, too clever for many people. So it, outside of the um, Tony Tebby's uh, own stuff, it wasn't used that often. Um, the point environment, as that I mentioned earlier, does all its magic by basically um, extending the number two thread and um, does everything better and um, differently. Okay, development on the QL. There were many languages in the early days. Uh, several Pascal compilers, several C compiler, um, whatever. Um, none of them really matter anymore, except for some people really into retro computing and retro software. The main thing today is still in use is the GST assembler and linker, which is used to assemble SMSQE2. There's also a, a more up-to-date assembler written by a user called George Quilt, which is, uh, has extended um, uh, 6 to 8, 20 uh, syntax and stuff. And I recommend the QMake utility, 
which basically you give a linker file and it does all the compiling and stuff, it makes things easier. For super basic, there were two main compilers, the cool liberator compiler, which was very forgiven, uh, forgiven with um, syntax and uh, could integrate most of the basic extensions within the resulting executable, which was pretty cool. And the turbo compiler, which was much faster, but also much more restricted with what you could do with it. On C, there's more or less only one option. This is C86 uh, compiler, which is an open source compiler written by Dave Walker and back then his brother, I think. It's really old. It hasn't been updated in a long time. It's non-optimizing. It has a little bit of C99 support, but um, a few things are very annoying. Uh, but it has the most complete um, operating system library. And it's the compiler I use when I use C. XTC uh, 68 is the same, but uh, a cross compiler for Linux and uh, Unix systems, I think. There's QDIS GCC, uh, which is a very patched or very old GCC 295. It's pretty hard to get working these days. Uh, I failed a few times. I, I ma then managed to run it in a Docker container by uh, a Docker built by somebody else, but um, it really would need an update. Or I have read on your page that uh, there's some efforts to get uh, LVMM <laughs> working for the 68K, so that would be pretty cool. A uh, very recent development is um, FreePascal has been ported to the QL uh, more or less as a joke for the QL Vember 2020 last year, which was the November of month for the QL. Um, I helped improve it a bit, but as the libraries are still very, very basic, you can't really do much about it at the moment, but at least one person is wo uh, working on it. So let's see. If it ever gets self-hosted, that would be a pretty cool step. Um, a few words to my emulator QPC. It's one, if not the first available commercial 68,000 emulator for PCs. It was released in 1996. Um, the first version emulated a real QL, but I had very limited limited processor power to work with back then. I mean, I, I think I myself had the uh, 486 DX33. And if you want to emulate a seven and a half megahertz processor on a 33 megahertz processor, even though it has a better um, instruction per clock uh, ratio, it's, it's, it's pretty hard. So, um, I switched to SMS QE because that freed me of emulating the QL hardware and checking every write access for, oh, did you write to this? Then I must do this. And so um, it's, uh, it used the line A emulator basically. So the OS could say, oh, here, do this. So here, do that. And that had speed up things quite a bit. Not so much a problem these days, but back then um, it was, actually three times faster than a standard QL on a 66 megahertz um, PC, which was not too bad. QPC1 was written for DOS and was 100% uh, assembler, um, Intel assembler, which is a huge pain if you come from the 68,000. Um, I still did it, mostly because a friend of mine said, you will never be able to do it. <laughs> It's in the end, it was 15,000 lines of code. It was a commercial product back then, sold for I think 250 German marks, uh, including the uh, license for the SMS GUI operating system, which was commercial back then too. UPC2 was the first uh, for Windows, which was then a 50 50 mix between the old assembler code, which uh, the emulation core and the, the interfacing, and C, which uh, did all the um, Windows uh, side of things. And QPC for uh, version 5 was only released uh, two months ago, actually. And I 
but was in the making for three years or so. I never finished it, I was quite finished with it. And was a major rewrite of almost all the code in C, so it could be maintained a little bit easier. The only thing still in assembler is the X8000 emulator, which is still eight or 9,000 lines of assembler code. I'm coming to a point where I have probably to um, replace that too with something that can be compiled on different uh, CPU architectures, but I'm hesitating because of all the work that's involved with it. For what it's worth, it's already uh, was pretty bug free actually. I, between five and 10 bucks were found within 25 years, so I'm pretty proud of that too. And in the end, it was um, 6820 actually, with the help of uh, George Quilt again, who also did the assembler I mentioned earlier. That's a rough timeline. I started in 1993, and now in 2021, the last release was made. 2014, um, QVC2 became freeware. That was when my uh, daughter was born. So I said, ah, here, have at it. I'm celebrating. So you can just download it from my page and um, play with it if you run Windows. Or if you even if you run Mac and uh, or Linux, uh, it uh, oh. works uh, pretty well with Wine, uh, the emulation layer. Um, just a word about a few other emulators. There's also Q emulator, which originated on the Mac and is now main, uh, mainly a Windows uh, application, um, probably because the author worked for Microsoft at the time. Um, it's one of the best uh, if you just want to have the raw QL experience, not the uh, extended high color whatever stuff, but even though it has some kind of high color mode uh, also integrated, but um, it's mostly for the, the basic uh, QL experience and if you want to play old games and stuff. SMS Cumulator is um, very much some, could almost say a rewrite of QPC, but in Java. And it's open source and you can run it on almost everything. I think where Java runs there are also the UQLX and SQLX versions, Unix-based emulators that actually share the um, emulation core with QEmulator. And um, I think UQLX is uh, X-based and SQLX is uh, with another UI, UI library. Um, if you Google it, you will find many resources. QLA, QL2K is a pretty old, QLA itself is very old. I think it was some university project or something. And a, a few people uh, extended it over the years, but it's very basic. Tessa Rooks is, uh, or however it's, it's spoken, it's a very recent addition. Uh, it's uh, um, multi-platform emulator for much of the um, um, Sinclair uh, computers and now also SQL. And Kudos Classic for Amiga is pretty old, but it's actually just a Kudos implementation that can be uh, executed in Amiga. And I think that's almost the last slide. Um, as a hobby, I started uh, developing, uh, or I should start the other way. Um, there's an interface called QLSD, which is um, an interface that can attach SD cards to the QL and was developed by somebody else. And it had one, uh, a few problems because it didn't work with the uh, CPU and acceleration, acceleration cards. So I take a, took a look at it and um, actually improved the uh, uh, CPLD code. So I had to learn Verilog and the, the whole stuff and managed to make it work. And that was, but, it was so much work that I started to produce it myself because I said, oh, if, if I do the, all this work, I want people to have it. And that's how this looked like. It's pretty tiny and it comes with the operating system ROM on top and the whole magic is actually not visible here <laughs> because it's under the chip. With another daughter board um, here where you can put the um, SD cards in. And that was my entry into the FPGA and SCPLD and very locked world. And by the way, this is the latest version that's not read, 
uh, yet released that can be put in the back of the QL and gives you uh, two SD cards and has actually eight different operating system can be stored on the flash here. Um, so now I could program FPGAs barely, but I could. And so I had a look at the uh, Mr. FPGA board, uh, board which is a, a pretty cool uh, retro uh, FPGA platform, open source, based on the DE10 nano board, which uh, contains an Altera Cyclone 5 chip. Um, the thing with the Alter uh, DE10 nano board is that it costs less than the chip alone. So it, it's about 110 euros or something last time I checked. And if you want to buy the chip that on it, um, it's actually more expensive. It's apparently subsidized by Intel. So um, it's a pretty uh, cheap way to get this very, very powerful um, FPGA, which already includes two uh, ARM cores, uh, hard cores and, and, and stuff and 32 gigabyte of RAM and everything. So it's a pretty cool platform. You still need a few other additional boards, like um, this here is the SD RAM board, because although it has uh, 32 gigabytes on board, the RAM is not uh, low latency enough because it's shared with the ARM cores for uh, most systems. So there's a separate, um, separate SD RAM board here. The upper board is not really necessary anymore. It, it adds uh, VGA and sound out, but you, you can live without it if you want. And the lower board here is just a USB hub. You don't need that either. So this is the platform. There was a very basic uh, QL for already for it, but it it's, was really hardly usable. Um, so I had a go at it and I I learned a lot from it, because um, if you just started uh, writing FPGA code, it's a pretty a big step to exchange a whole 68,000 call with a different, that has a completely different interface and everything. And uh, amaz amazingly, it worked eventually. So it now has a cycle exact FX 68K core, which is uh, actually somebody developed this apparently by having a look at the actual chip with a microscope and really recreating uh, the whole thing. And I emulate the QL speed for games. There are not so many great games for the QL, but a few are quite OK. So <laughs> it can be uh, executed accurately uh, with this. On the upper speed, uh, I went up to 42 megahertz which is also not too bad for a QL. It has the QLSD integrated and it works at every speed, unlike the old implementation, which only worked at the low speed. I implemented, actually implemented one sort of one of the gold cards that I mentioned earlier. So it can execute SMSQE, which is uh, pretty cool. And only last week I fixed a long standing problem with it. If I type very fast, it lost keys, key presses. And I was really stumped for a while because it, it didn't make sense. Why, why would it lose these key presses? Until I had the idea that maybe the QL also lost key presses. And actually, that's the case. Uh, uh, that's the, case. Um, the original QL had this bug too. But you couldn't really type as fast on the old keyboard like you could now with a laptop keyboard. So it didn't um, uh, happen that often in, in comparison. And also, there was back in the day, there was already an alternative co-processor called Hermes, which fixed this bug. And all my QLs basically had this processor forever. So I, I didn't know it was a bug in the QL. And um, one or two weeks ago, I got the rights from the original authors to include it in the Mr. FPGA QL core. So I think that was long enough. And I am at the end of my presentation. And you have to imagine that the red cursor is blinking at this point.